Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, firstly, I should thank the Circle and Salesforce for organizing this event. Uh, and Michael, I have to say, we're so impressed with your dedication to this event and all wondering why the heck you're not in Brazil. But anyway, um, I actually wanted to start off, uh, before I started off, to acknowledge some of my colleagues. So um, firstly, I've got a, a dear friend of mine here called Brad Cooper, who happens to also run BT um, on the side. Um, so any wealth uh, needs, definitely say hello to Brad. Brad, give a little wave. <laughs> We've also got Caroline here, um, who I'll have to say, who looks after our external and our internal affairs. I'll have to say, Caroline, I'm sure one of your proudest moments was when Westpac announced the 100 million education fund, which was just a fabulous event. I do want to also acknowledge a few of my members of my executive team, because basically I have got an absolutely incredible team. I've got my CFO here, Peter Sarantzoukalos. I'm not sure where he is. Uh, wave, Peter. Uh, he's the absolute bedrock of uh, Saint, the St. George Banking Group. We've got Diren Kulkarni, our Chief Information Officer, where's Diren, who's an absolute legend when it comes to innovation and technology. We've got Martin Jaeger. Martin, you should stand up. <laughs> because, no, no, I'm serious. <laughs> Martin, Martin is, Martin is actually one of the best marketers in this country, but more importantly, she's the CEO of Rams, uh, looks after our third-party broking and also marketing. So anyone that is moving into a new home or thinking about an extension, please go and say hello to Martin. <laughs> and the final person I wanted to acknowledge was Philip Godkin. Philip, you should stand up as well. Um, Philip is the best business banker in this country. He looks after uh, all of our business banking within the St. George Banking Group from you know, our, our corner stores to right up to our largest family businesses in Australia. So anyone looking for a business loan or wants a transaction banking service or talk about their financial markets needs, please go and see Philip. Anyway, it's a huge, huge pleasure to be here to share with you today some of my thoughts on what is um, a digital and mobility revolution. It is something that is going to impact most industries, both yours and mine. And for me, there's effectively three events that signpost the beginning of this um, transformation. Firstly, I recall back in 1982 as an electronics engineering student sit sitting in a lecture when uh, my then um, quite excited data communications professor announced the formation of the computer science network using the, inter in, uh, the internet protocol TCP IP. What this network di did is effectively for the first time enabled universities around the globe to really share information. So you can see, I mean, universities at the time were really, really excited about this. Importantly for us, what that led to seven years down the track is the formation of the World Wide Web. I can also recall uh, back in 1983 when um, I helped design Bell South's mobile network uh, in New Zealand. Uh, now, um, those of you... Back then, if you think about a mobile phone, it, it effectively looked like a brick and weighed like a brick and probably didn't smell like a brick, but it was definitely a brick. And I'm sure some of you uh, would recall that. But even back then, we knew that this uh, device would absolutely transform our lives. And in 2007, Apple launched its first iPhone. Now, the thing about Apple's iPhone, it was the first time from a mobile device that you could quickly, easily, and in a user-friendly way, access the internet. Now, that user-friendly mechanism was extended with the introduction of um, Apple's iPad in 2009. Now, as an avid uh, chess player, I, I recall uh, with wonder of the news back in um, 1997 when IBM's Deep Blue computer finally beat a grandmaster in chess. Now, at that time, there was a lot of controversy over this. You know, did IBM twi tweak the uh, computer between games and all sorts of things? But now we know, actually, most chess applications could achieve similar results. So you can see how far computational um, capability has gone. So these three events, for me, are really important place markers in terms of the beginning of this digital and mobility revolution. But if we look at the Industrial Revolution, which took some 200 years, 
This sort of indicates we're, that we're just at the start of this revolution. And the exciting thing for me is when I look at the Industrial Revolution, what that did, did was effectively leverage our physical strength, whereas the Digital and Mobility Revolution leverages our ability to think on the go. We all know we now use um, phones to monitor our sleeping habits, God forbid. Uh, you know, if, if we don't know a song on the radio, we use the mobile phone to check that out. We record our child's first steps and, you know, some of us are sending our entire photo albums up into the sky, up into the cloud, I should say. Now, this year, if you look at St George, there'll be over half a million of our customers that either do part or all of their banking using a mobile device. Now, that's in between, by the way, um, in between watching the latest um, episode of House of Cards or ordering a pizza, pizza or monitoring their stocks in real time on the Hang Seng. The thing for us is if you look at our mobile banking customers, over the last two years, they've more than doubled. But um, we've got a strong sense that effectively we're only at the start of that, that journey. Now, the great challenge today is how do you get ahead of the curve? And as um, Rupert Murdoch recently um, put it, how do you become amongst the disruptors of this digital re revolution as opposed to one of those that's been disrupted? Now, 12 months ago, I would have said that actually being a fast follower in this probably would be okay or enough. Now I strongly believe that you've got to strive to be a leader. And, and the reason that's the case is things are moving extremely fast. And it's easy to forget that actually tablets did not exist before 2009. Now at St. George, we take a huge amount of pride at being the first online bank in Australia, the second bank uh, in the world to do so. Now that was partly as a result of the courage, uh, the imagination and the foresight of the then CEO, John Thames, and also of our current CEO, Darren Kulkarni, who's uh, actually here in the room, as you know, uh, who was part of the original team that developed the internet bank in, back in 1995. Now what that did for us is effectively started us on this journey of a culture of innovation which has enabled us to stay ahead of the curve. What I'd like to do in terms of the learnings out of that is really cover off six broad themes which I think are important. And they are themes that I think could help many industries stay ahead of the curve in terms of this digital and mobility revolution. These themes are courageous leadership, clarity of purpose, customers at the center, your people first, mobility only, and contextual information for one. So what, did I want, what I'd like to do is to cover off a little bit more detail on each of those. Now over the next five to 10 years, we're gonna need bold leaders that see opportunities where others see risk. And for me, leadership goes beyond you know, the chairman and the CEO, which you know, obviously are really important positions, uh, and it's all about every single person in your organisation. Because basically winning is both at a strategic level, so being able to have a view on what may be in 5, 10 and 20 years, but also just as importantly at the local level, where effectively you compete day in, day out. Successful, courageous leaders that actually navigate through this transition are likely to have a number of capabilities. Firstly, having the ability to see not around one corner, but a number of corners and anticipate change. This is all about having really strong strategic skills and being comfortable with uncertainty. Be being able to attract a diverse workforce and encouraging diversity of thought. Both of these are absolutely critical for innovation. And this is not um, just about being open to new ideas, but actively seeking new ideas. Being able to abandon what's made you successful in the past. Um, you've got to have an objective of saying you want to make a difference and constantly looking at ways of improving. Being inclusive, having empathy, and really caring about people. Because that is all about, number one, attracting talent but also being able to develop long-term relationships with your customers. 
And finally, having a solid understanding of technology, digital, and mobility. Leaders of today and tomorrow will not be able to delegate this. My second point is clarity of purpose. This is the why we're in business. Now, revolutions, by definition, are difficult times. They, there's a lot of uncertainty, and things move quickly. So for me, clarity of purpose is what enables you to navigate through that change. And at St. George, we never forget that there's two key parts to our purpose. Firstly, and, th and these were forged effectively over 75 years of the history of St. George. Firstly, it's all about helping our customers save, get into their homes and retire comfortably. The second part of our purpose is to help small businesses establish, prosper, grow and contribute to their, to their communities. These, this, these elements of our purpose guide every decision we make, both short term and long term. My third theme, which is customers at the centre, is not something new. The great hotelier, Caesar um, Ritz, um, in his time actually assembled some of the greatest chefs to, to serve meals in his restaurants. And if a customer actually sent a meal back, he had one simple rule. The customer is never wrong. The question in this digital revolution is not how digital and mobility can help your business. The question is how digital and mobility can help the customer. Because that's what the disruptor is going to be thinking. To illustrate, I wanted to actually discuss uh, what Uber is doing. And I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with Uber, probably quite a few um, given the, um, the makeup of this room. But basically, what it is, it's an app where you can actually order a car or a cab um, and basically on your mobile phone, watch on a map as that cab um, travels to you. And after you, you, you um, arrive at your destination, you just leave the cab because basically you get automatically billed and the receipt emailed to you. Now, the thing is that this app has, has totally transformed two parts of the experience. The first thing is the cab turns up. <laughs> so improve the reliability dramatically. The second thing is they've eliminated part of the experience that we hate or dislike, and that's the payment bit. You know, do I have enough change? Do I have to tip? So there's no doubt Uber is really shaking up this industry in a number of countries. The scary thing about this example is that Uber is just an app. It's not a major technology company or a major internet company, although my guess uh, they probably will be one day. So when you look at that, from my, ex my experience is what is required is a focus on really delivering an exceptional customer experience. Now to do that, my sense is that you've really got to look at the, the customer experience in different parts. There'll be parts of the experience that our customers absolutely hate or get annoyed by. That part of the experience you either have to eliminate or automate through digital and mobility. Now there'll be parts of the experience where through digital and mobility technology, you can actually enhance the, the experience through either providing better context, reliability, speed, or you know, taking into account user preferences. And importantly for us, there'll be parts of the experience where actually an individual is still really important. A banker is still really critical. Now, it may not necessarily be face-to-face. -face. We're seeing now that video is becoming extremely more and more popular as people get used to Skyping. But what's important about that part is you've really got to look at that and make sure the way you deliver that service, uh, every interaction, every day, is extraordinary. So they're the three ways we, we, we need to look at to make sure we're delivering exceptional service. Now, this leads me to my next theme, because to actually have an organisation that delivers exceptional service, you have to put your people first. You have to have a culture of innovation. Uh, you have to have a culture that actually attracts diverse, a diverse workforce that has diversity of thought 
and is very agile. And this is all about making sure you put mechanisms in place to achieve those objectives. Now, just to give you one example of what we're doing within St. George, every year we pick the top 15 under 30-year-olds to represent the youth of our company um, within, within our organisation. And what that, those 15 do is they actually attend some of our most senior meetings and, and actively contribute to both our strategy and our innovation. Now, this does a number of things. One is, if you think about the younger people within your organisation, they're more likely to understand how the user of tomorrow is going to want their banking. So we can learn from them. But just as importantly, it, it gives uh, two strong messages. One is, it gives a message to the organisations that every idea is important. Every idea is worth listening to. And what it does, it starts helping break down the traditional command and control structures that large organisations have. My next theme addresses mo mobility only. Now, how important one's technology platform is is something that a lot of leaders worry about. And we know from Moore's law that that still applies, which effectively states that technological innovation continues to improve at an exponential rate. So effectively, something, a piece of technology hardware that today costs $1,000, Moore's law will predict that in 10 years' time, that piece of technology is going to cost $10. So what's important is not necessarily what your core systems are like. What's more important is how technology is a helping, helping your business model. You know, how data is stored, how you extract customer information to help serve that customer, how straight through processing is making it easier for customers. Now, on the software side, this, this is a little bit more problematic. It's always a more complex issue. But we've seen with cloud computing that even in this area, software now is much more available at a much more reasonable price. Now, I'm announcing today that St. George's business model going forward is going to be developed with a mobility first philosophy and a mobility only philosophy. Now what this means is when you look at our customer service from designing products to actually delivering customer service, it will be mobile led. And then we'll adapt it to online and our physical service delivery. Now if you see the progress that's been made in HTML5, what that has enabled us to do is actually to take on adaptive um, development, which allows us effectively to develop applications which then adapt to the particular device that the customer happens to be using or method of service that the customer is choosing. Now, what's more important, there is technology that enables this, but what's more important about this is actually that our customers are demanding this. Our customers are demanding to be able to do their banking when, where, and how they want to do their banking. So rather than, um, so, so basically, but I do want to stress, this is not about making our bank digital only. So Rob, feel, feel sec secure about that. It is about actually saying, look, it's designing our services um, with, mo with a mobility philosophy. We are extremely proud of our extensive branch network, a network that just provides exceptional service, a network that effectively our customers choose to, to visit, particularly for their more important financial decisions. But again, as, as you've noted, our objective within our network is to provide exceptional service. Now, this is something that Gail Kelly, um, our group CEO, put us on a journey on when she first um, joined the Westpac Group some six years ago, which was all about one of our key beliefs is that we're about delighting our customers. Now, I wanted to give you an example of how um, technology and this philosophy of delighting customers at a branch level sort of come together. And we're exploring the potential to use Apple's iBeacon technology to help us provide a much more personalised service to customers that visit our branches. And we're trialling this now in three branches. So we're the first in Australia to do so. So again, another notch in our first in terms of St George. Now, what, uh, with the iBeacon technology within Branch and a customer's mobile phone and if they've used our mobile app uh, application, we'll be able to identify when that customer 
is visiting our branch. And then what we could do is send a, a, a personalised uh, welcome to that customer um, and offering for them to either meet with our branch manager or another specialist. Now, if the customer chooses to meet our branch manager, our branch manager then will have at their fingertips a whole lot of critical information to make that customer experience much more uh, enjoyable. Now, at every stage, the customer has the choice to opt out, to either continue the interaction or not. Now, the interesting thing about this is, if you think about the iBeacon technology and my point about Moore's Law uh, and the cost of technology, this is an, I be uh, an Apple iBeacon. Uh, effectively, and this is what we will put in our branches, this costs around $30. So it just goes to show how far things have gone. Now, Rod, um, I, I wanted actually to touch on, on your p personal issue, which I think many of our customers are experienced. They, they tend to be, they tend to be, yeah, it, it's the technology issue. <laughs> now, they tend to be a little bit more of our mature customers, but also our more high-valued customers, which, you know, just starting to have a foray into this digital world. Um, and, and look, you know, it's interesting, if you think about um, iPad and, and tablet take-up, uh, some of the, the biggest increase of that take-up is in the older, older uh, demographic, because basically it's grandparents just absolutely loving to Skype with their grandchildren. Now, what we've done in St. George is we offer now uh, absolutely free training programs and certificates in online and internet banking. And we also offer a 24 help line in terms of uh, your inter internet banking and how you um, access that service. So this is all about making a small, in a small way, helping our customers through that journey. Now, I also wanted to touch on the role of information. Uh, now, data is a fascinating area and also sometimes a little bit of a contentious area. Uh, but it is an area that you would expect banks to actually excel in. Now, for those of us that actually can harness that information in terms of you know, transactions, real-time market feeds, customer service records, correspondence that customers have with the bank, or even social media posts, all linked, by the way, to where the customer physically is, can deliver an exceptional personalised customer service if it's all brought together. Now, an example of a company, obviously, that uses information extremely well uh, to enhance the customer experience is Google. Um, and um, if you look at Google's approach to this, they're starting to now go from just the data and, and knowledge of the customer to entering the physical world. Um, I don't know if who saw the... Uh, the news reports of, of the Google car, but you know, I mean, it just gives you one example of how they're progressing on multiple fronts. And by the way, you know, an automated car has uh, got such a compelling business case from a society's perspective, uh, because basically if you have automated cars, you can reduce the amount of infrastructure, so road infrastructure, and if you think about uh, the environmental impact that has by 30%, so I have absolutely no doubt down the track, this is something that will be adopted. Not necessarily Google's one, but a, a form of that. Now, last year I had the, um, the, the, uh, the opportunity to visit Google and, and try their Google Glass. And look, you know, I, I recall when I was at that, um, you know, there was like these six, I don't know, they looked like seven-year-olds coming in with these Google Glasses, and you initially think, oh, this is going to be a bit wacky. But when you actually try them, um, you know, I have absolutely no doubt some form of this will be used. And I can see a time when you, you know, you're going to walk into a store uh, with your Google Glasses, compare real time the price of the product, and then with real time check the balance of your accounts and see if you've got enough money. Now, if the price is right, you'll then transfer some money and make the purchase. So that, to me, is very close, one form or, or another. In fact, uh, Diran and his team are working with Google Glass at the moment for us to have a mobile app ready for the launch of Google Glass in terms of sales uh, in Australia. Now, Google definitely is a company to watch. Um, and if Google takes an interest in your industry, uh, my advice is start a war room and all Uh, 
um, then basically what this does is prompts the customer to join the loyalty uh, part of our service to improve what, what is op being offered to, to those customers. So if you look at year to date, we've had over 4.8 million solutions like this offered to our customers, and it is all about enhancing the experience for the customer. So to conclude, um, digital and mobility will transform industries. Now, the digital and mobility revolution, from my perspective, is just at the start, but things are moving really, really quickly. The one thing certain for me is that customers will benefit as a result of this. So either you deliver that or someone else will. And being at the forefront of this revolution is really exciting and can provide us and our industries some exciting opportunities. But we've also seen that if you're not ahead of the curve, um, you can also flounder. The thing is, if there's a successful disruptor within your industry, it is really, really hard to recover from that. So that's why it's important to stay ahead of the curve. And we talked about six themes that I think are important. Now, any one of those on, on its own is, is critical. But I think the most successful businesses, the ones that are really going to prosper, are those that excel on all six fronts. Thank you very much.